Salam, selamat pagi. Sekali lagi kita berjumpa di dalam ibadah di atas talian. Saya percaya, walaupun di atas talian, tetapi Tuhan tetap sama. Pada hari ini, barisan pujian penyembahan ataupun barisan imamat rajani ini akan membawa kita dalam pujian penyembahan. Sesuai dengan firman Tuhan, masuklah pintu gerbangnya dengan pujian syukur dan pelatarannya dengan puji-pujian. Nah sebelum kita masuk dalam pujian penyembahan, mari saya membawa kita di dalam doa. Allah Bapa kami yang di surga, pada hari ini kami akan memuji dan menyembah engkau. Kami akan bersekutu bersama-sama dalam ibadah pada hari ini. Kami istiharkan kuasa kemurahan, kasih karunia Allah mengalir dalam setiap pribadi kami. Biarlah kami dapat melihat kuasamu pada hari ini di dalam ibadah pada pagi ini. Dalam nama Yesus kami berdoa. Amin. Haleluya, mari memuji Tuhan, jemaat Tuhan yang uh, di atas talian. Mari kita sama-sama bangkit untuk uh, membesarkan Tuhan pada pagi ini.
setiap satu kita Ketika kita minta Kau memberi Ketika ku ketuk untukmu Kau bukan karena Mari kita Kasih yang sempurna
Engkau Bapa yang kekal bagi kami. Engkau Bapa yang sentiasa mengasihi kami dengan kasih yang abadi. Terima kasih Tuhan betapa indahnya di hadiratmu. Sebentar lagi kami akan mendengar dari firman. Mari kau lawat kami sekali lagi. Dalam nama Yesus kami berdoa. Amin. Haleluya. Sekali lagi kita sampai kepada bahagian firman Tuhan. Yang bertema orang Kristen dan perjanjian baru. Sekali lagi orang Kristen dan perjanjian baru. Ataupun orang yang percaya kepada Yesus Kristus. Dan perjanjian baru. Saya akan mengajak kita untuk membaca dari Ibrani pasal 8. Ibrani pasal 8 mulai dari ayat 8. Ayat 8 dari Ibrani pasal 8 berkata. Sebab ia menegur mereka ketika ia berkata. Sesungguhnya akan datang waktunya, demikianlah firman Tuhan, aku akan mengadakan perjanjian baru dengan kamu kaum Israel dan dengan kaum Yehuda. Ayat 9, bukan seperti perjanjian yang telah kuadakan de dengan nenek moyang mereka, pada waktu aku memegang tangan mereka untuk membawa mereka keluar dari tanah Mesir. Sebab mereka tidak setia kepada perjanjianku dan aku menolak mereka demikianlah firman Tuhan. Nah kalau kita melihat bahagian firman Tuhan dari Ibrani pasal 8 ini. Nabi Yesaya pada zaman Nabi-Nabi. Dia berlubuat bahwa pada satu masa nanti Allah akan membuat perjanjian baru dengan orang Israel dan Yehuda. Nah pada waktu zaman selepas Yesus, lalu penulis Ibrani menulis dan ampil dari kitab Yesaya ini bahwa sesungguhnya Allah akan datang dan membuat perjanjian baru bersama Israel. Nah di dalam kisah hidup orang Israel ada perjanjian lama. Waktu mereka keluar dari tanah Mesir alat ampil tangan mereka dan membawa mereka ke tanah kenaan. Dan dia membuat perjanjian bersama mereka. Yang paling popular di sana ialah hukum sepuluh. Dan disinilah orang Israel gagal dan gagal lagi. Karena yang pertama di sana, jangan ada Allah lain di hadapanku. Hukum yang nomor satu inilah yang paling rampan. Ataupun paling banyak sekali Israel langgar. Yang lain itu kurang. Yang nomor satu inilah habis-habisan dari raja sampai orang-orang. Bahkan sampai anak kecil. Kata Yeremia. Dia berkata bahwa ayahnya membuat mezbah untuk penyembahan berhala. Istrinya pergi ambil kayu api. Dan anak-anaknya mengumpul batu. Sama-sama membentuk satu tempat penyembahan. Satu keluarga. Satu kali membuat penyembahan yang lain daripada menyembah Allah. Tuhan sangat kecewa dengan bangsa itu. Dan Tuhan berjanji bahwa dia akan membuat satu perjanjian baru. Nah waktu Yesus datang, Yesus berkata bahwa kita akan membuat perjanjian baru. Nah saya membaca dari 1 Korintus pasal 11 ayat 25 bagi kita. Supaya kita melihat bagaimana perjanjian baru itu terjadi. 1 Korintus 11 ayat 25 berkata. Demikian juga ia mengambil cawan, sesudah makan lalu berkata, cawan ini adalah perjanjian baru yang dimeteraikan oleh darahku. Perbuatlah ini setiap kali kamu meminumnya, 
menjadi peringatan akan aku. Nah ayat ini selalu dibaca kalau kita membuat perjamuan Tuhan dalam gereja. Ada per, orang membuat perjamuan dalam gereja satu kali satu bulan. Itu itu arahan dan itu perlembagaan manusia. Ada juga yang membuat satu kali satu tahun. Itu juga arahan dari HESQ ataupun pusat denominasi itu. Ada juga yang membuat lima tahun satu kali. Dan ada juga yang langsung tidak buat perjamuan Tuhan. Itu orang tidak peduli tentang Tuhan dan dia tidak mengenal Tuhan juga. Dan kalau kita mau melihat ayat Alkitab tentang perjanjian baru. Dalam kisah para rasul kita lihat begini. Bahwa setiap hari mereka akan berkumpul di rumah-rumah. Mereka akan memecahkan roti dan, dan minum angkor. Ini berarti perjamuan Tuhan. Setiap hari kata kisah para rasul. Nah, kalau kita lihat dalam bahagian ini. Inilah cawan perjamuan Tuhan. Cawan darahku yang ditumpahkan bagi banyak orang. Menjadi meterai dalam perjanjian baru. Yesus membuat perjanjian baru. Bahagian dari pihak Allah, Allah sendiri dari pihak manusia, Yesus mewakili kita dan membuat perjanjian baru. Saya sangat suka dengan perjanjian baru ini. Karena dalam perjanjian baru, segala kekurangan, ketidaksangkupan manusia untuk mengikuti hukum Taurat ataupun sepuluh hukum sahaja telah Yesus buat bahwa dia membawa manusia dan masuk dalam hadirat Allah dan dibenarkan di hadapan Tuhan untuk selamanya karena darah Yesuslah yang membenarkan menyucikan bahagian kita. Karena sebelum perjanjian baru, perjanjian lama, setiap tahun darah harus dipercikkan di atas penutup tabut perjanjian. Setiap tahun Tahun ini dibuat hore, kita selamat. Di tahun depan takut lagi. Imam besar harus masuk lagi. Buat lagi. Sudah dia keluar, Whoa. selesai hore, kita selamat lagi. Tahun depan takut lagi, buat lagi. Berkali-kali dan cukup-cukup membebankan. Tetapi Yesus berkata, ada satu perjanjian baru. Dibuat oleh Yesus bawa darahnya satu kali ke hadirat Tuhan. Bukan dalam tabut perjanjian Tuhan. Di surga satu kali. Dia bawa nah ini darah yang suci tidak bercela satu kali dan selesai. Dia bukan hanya selesai di sana saja. Perjanjian baru ini. Dia membawa satu hal. Engkau sudah benar di hadapan Tuhan. Kedua, ada janji yang sukar diklaim oleh bangsa lain seluar, selain bangsa Israel. Dapat klaim janji-janji Abraham. Dan setiap janji yang ada dalam Alkitab ini, engkau boleh klaim karena perjanjian baru. Di dalam perjanjian baru juga, bahwa saya dan saudara, sudah milik Tuhan. Saya dan saudara adalah manusia yang baru. Kita diberi roh yang baru. Dan kita diberi buah-buah roh dan karunia-karunia roh. Sesuai dengan panggilan Tuhan. Sesuai dengan rencana Tuhan. Sesuai dengan apa yang Allah mau. Nah pada hari ini, waktu kita melihat perjanjian baru ini terjadi... Ternyata bahwa Yesus yang melakukannya dan sekarang kita hidup dalam perjanjian baru. Yang saya sedar dalam perjanjian baru ini bahwa surga telah menyediakan segala sesuatu untuk saya dan saudara hidup. Untuk orang Kristen untuk hidup. Kita mempunyai kuasa dari Allah. Tetapi banyak kali kita sebagai orang Kristen kita lupa bahwa kita sudah mempunyai kuasa dari Tuhan. Karena dikatakan waktu roh kudus turun di atasmu, engkau mendapat kuasa. Dan kita lupa. Banyak kali waktu 
waktu orang berkata virus corona macam ini waktu vaksin datang banyak orang takut bersembunyi di hutan sekarang takut vaksin dan sampai orang telefon pastor macam mana vaksin ini ada chip 666 kah ya ampun dari mana kamu ini ada alkitab kah kamu di rumah ada pastor alkitab yuk wahyu berkata chip itu diletak di ibu jari dan di sini dan bukan di sini bukan di lengan itu orang yang ada Alkitab, mungkin tidak ada Alkitab, mungkin Alkitabnya ada, mungkin orang itu tidak pandai baca. Bahwa dia lupa yang mana ibu jari dan yang mana kening, dia mungkin dia pikir bahwa ini bahu ini juga ibu jari dan kening. Itu sudah satu zaman yang sudah tidak masuk akal pada zaman ini. Semua orang pandai baca dan dalam huayu berkata ibu jari dan di kening. Itu pun sudah waktu Yesus datang dan kita sudah naik ke surga. Tidak ada kita di sini. Haleluya. Wahyu sebut seperti itu. Saya sudah baca wahyu. Saya selidiki dan betul. Dan tidak perlu kita takut tentang vaksin. Vaksin is vaksin untuk kita tidak untuk kita tidak sakit, untuk kita sehat. Okay, Haleluya. Kalau kamu sehat tidak apa. Tetapi kami yang setengah sehat, ya kami perlu vaksin tu. Beri tahu menteri, ketua menteri kita. Bagus vaksinkan suntik pasti kami dulu itu yang paling penting supaya dia selamat panjang umur sampai 200 tahun pun boleh. Haleluya. Nah kasih karunia dan apa? Ada kasih karunia di dalam perjanjian baru ini yang saya suka. Ada kasih karunia di mana bahwa kita hidup karena kasih karunia. Tadi bahwa ada kuasa sekarang ada kasih karunia. Ada orang berfikir bahwa dia tidak mampu tidak apa? Karena kasih karunia Tuhan. Karena kasih karunia Tuhan, ataupun macam mana mau sebut, kalau bukan kasih, ini yang bahasa yang paling biasa disebut di pada zaman kami lah. Kalau bukan kasih, laut akan kering. Kalau bukan kasih, burung tidak berkicau. Kalau bukan kasih. Kering lautan, tiada yang ku rasa. Kalau bukan kasih, kalau bukan kasih karunia, tidak ada apa-apa yang saya dan saudara dapat di dunia. Kalau bukan kemurahan Tuhan, kita tidak dapat melihat matahari terbit dan juga sang surya tenggelam. Mau buat bahasa pujangka? Terbitnya matahari dan juga tenggelamnya, terbenamnya sang surya. Itu bahasa pujangka. Dan kalau bukan kasih karunia, saya dan saudara tidak dapat apa-apa. Kalau bukan kasih karunia, saya dan saudara tidak dapat menikmati apa yang ada dalam hidup. Tetapi karena kasih karunia dalam perjanjian baru ini, saya dan saudara boleh bersuka, boleh bersyukur dan boleh menikmati sesuatu yang kita mau di dunia ini dan tinggal kita berkata kepada Tuhan Tuhan berkatilah hidupku beri hikmat kebijaksanaan bagi saya beri saya peluang untuk pekerjaan sesuai dengan doa Yabes dia berkata Tuhan berkatilah saya dan jauhkan saya dari malapetaka dan juga sakit penyakit akhirnya Tuhan memberkati hidupnya dan dia lebih daripada saudara-saudaranya, adik-beradiknya yang lain. Dan Yabes menjadi terkenal pada zaman dia. Cukup saya dan saudara berkata, Tuhan tolong saya pada hari ini. Karena kasih karunia. Dalam perjanjian baru ini ada kasih karunia. Saya sangat suka. Saya percaya bahwa setiap gereja yang ada, harus mengerti tentang jalur kasih karunia. Kalau tidak kita akan hidup. Coba untuk hidup bagus. 
Gereja coba untuk hidup luar biasa sendiri. Dan pasti engkau akan gagal, gagal, dan gagal lagi. Saya telah, telah melihat manusia-manusia luar biasa. Manusia brilian, manusia berpotensi besar. Maju dalam hidup dan mereka gagal satu persatu. Tetapi ada orang maju dengan kasih karunia. Bergantung dan bergayut kepada kuasa Allah semata-mata. Akhirnya mereka makin hari, makin hebat, makin hari, makin luar biasa. Mereka sesuai dengan firman Tuhan. Orang yang menanti-nantikan Tuhan. Seperti burung Raja Wali yang naik terbang, diterjang badai, naik lagi dan naik lagi. Itulah orang Kristen yang hidup dalam kasih ataupun perjanjian baru. Bergantung kepada kasih karunia Allah. Mulai pada hari ini, mari gereja Tuhan, jangan lagi hidup dengan cara-cara dalam perjanjian lama. Mari kita berpaut kepada kasih karunia Tuhan, kuasa Allah dalam perjanjian baru. Bahwa yang tidak mungkin pada perjanjian lama, sangat-sangat mungkin dalam perjanjian baru. Yang tidak boleh, sangat sukar dalam perjanjian lama, itu perkara sangat mudah dan rampan dalam perjanjian baru. Untuk menyembuhkan orang sakit dalam perjanjian lama sukar sekali. Hanya Nabi sahaja. Tetapi di dalam perjanjian baru ini. Saya dan saudara. Setiap orang yang percaya kepada Yesus. Kata Markus pasal 16 ayat 17. Tanda-tanda ini akan menyertai orang-orang percaya. Mereka akan mengusir setan-setan demi namaku. Mereka akan berbicara dalam bahasa. Bahasa yang baru itu berbahasa roh. Kuras sentara karya sensa. Oh itu tidak dapat dibelajar. Kau belajar 10 tahun kah? Kau belajar 100 tahun untuk berbahasa roh? Tidak mungkin. Kau boleh buat bahasa-bahasa yang pelik-pelik dan aneh-aneh. Dan surga tolak itu kosong. Pangka lagi. Tetapi kalau roh Tuhan di dalam perjanjian baru. Engkau berbahasa roh. Surga bersorak. Oh lulus hebat. Karena apa? Karena kemurahan Tuhan. Kasih karunia juga. Perjanjian baru juga. Nah pada hari ini, mari apa yang tidak ada mungkin dalam perjanjian lama, sekarang dalam perjanjian baru sangat-sangat mungkin. Satu hal yang membelenggu negeri kita ini, kita ini pikir kita ini miskin. Tetapi sebenarnya kita sudah kaya di dalam perjanjian baru. Kalau mau kaya dengan sendirinya, oh tidak banyak orang. Tetapi kalau mau kaya di dalam Tuhan, itu sangat mungkin. Mudah sekali Tuhan meletakkan satu ekor ayam di meja makan kamu. Amin. Haleluya. Sangat-sangat mudah. Saya satu kali, saya mau makan mie kolok. Sebenarnya saya apa? Saya tak ada duit juga. Tapi waktu saya berjalan ada orang panggil. Eh, pok sini pok. Duduk sini. Ini satu mie kolok orang tidak mau makan. Kena ada emergency dia. Sayang, saya makanlah. Bayarkah? Oh tidak, free itu. Kata Toke. Hebat sih. Sangat-sangat mudah. Bagi Tuhan, bagi satu pinggan mikolok di atas meja kamu. Di dalam perjanjian baru, sesuai dengan kasih karunia, kemurahan Tuhan, segala sesuatu mungkin pada hari ini. Segala sesuatu mungkin. BM Grace sudah mengalami itu. Dan kalau engkau tidak ada iman lagi, tidak berpaut kepada Perjanjian baru kasih karunia dan kemurahan Tuhan sudah keterlaluan pada hari ini. Kita sudah diberi tanah oleh kerajaan. Kita di, sudah diberi dana oleh kerajaan. Itu pekerjaan dalam perjanjian baru. Bergaut kepada kasih karunia dan kemurahan Tuhan. Tuhan buat. Hanya kita letak iman saja. Beriman saja. Tuhan boleh buat. Haleluya. Tuhan boleh buat lebih besar lagi. Haleluya. Saya percaya. Saya cakap. Dan yang saya cakap, jarang sekali gagal. Kalau sudah gagal, itu sudah keterlaluan. Itu mustahil. Tetapi yang kita cakap dengan iman Tuhan buat, itu yang perkara biasa bagi perjanjian baru. Nah orang Kristen dengan perjanjian baru harus jadi luar biasa pada hari ini. Yang tidak mungkin dalam pikiran kamu, dalam generasi dari Datuk Nenek Moyang kamu tidak mungkin. Dalam perjanjian baru sangat-sangat mungkin pada hari ini. Ada siapa-siapa lahir di sini lalu terus menyanyi? Tak ada kan? 
Lahir saja dari kantungan ibu. Terus menyanyi. Bagi Tuhan tak ada yang mustahil. Pasti dokter akan pengsan. Nes-nes akan pengsan. Bagi Tuhan tak ada yang tak mungkin. Pasti nes pengsan. Tetapi yang kita ini lahir dan biasa-biasa. Karena kemurahan, kasih karunia, perjanjian baru. Saya dan saudara menjadi manusia luar biasa. Seharusnya gelar orang Kristen itu ialah manusia-manusia yang luar biasa. Patutlah Alkitab sebut bahwa orang yang percaya tidak ada yang mustahil bagi mereka kata Yesus. Orang yang percaya mereka lebih dari pemenang kata kitab Roma ataupun Surat Roma Haleluya Haleluya Saya akan mengakhiri khotbah ini dengan doa pada pagi ini Mari kita berdoa Terima kasih Tuhan Terima kasih Yesus Pada hari ini kami telah belajar Bagaimana perjanjian baru mengubah hidup kami Karena iman Kasih karunia dan kemurahan dari Tuhan Lalu kami Menjadi manusia yang luar biasa di dalam engkau. Bukan karena kuat, bukan karena gagah. Tetapi karena roh Tuhan yang diberikan di dalam diri kami sebagai orang yang percaya. Berkati umatmu, berkati firmanmu. Dalam nama Yesus kami berdoa. Amin. Haleluya. Praise you, Lord. Let's, um, church, let us give our Lord Jesus the highest praise. Are you ready? Let's do this.
know that there's a lot of battles in our lives, but the battle belongs to our Lord, and the victory is His forever and ever. Hallelujah. with weapons unseen your enemies crash to their knees as we rise up in worship when trials unleash like a flood the battle belongs to us we cry out in Your name. 
praise you, Lord. Oh, powerful God. BM Grace and anyone that's watching in, if you are under some kind of a cloud, some kind of oppression, just reach out your hand to the screen and call out his name. Jesus, Jesus, deliver me. Lift this weight up from me. For I know and I hear you are all powerful. Spirit of oppression, go in Jesus' name. Go in Jesus' name. The Lord reigns. Hallelujah. The Lion of Judah roars. Roars in our lives. Roars in your lives. King of kings and Lord of lords, we bless your holy name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise you, Lord. Welcome to church. Who would have thought that we have church via a handphone or a computer? <laughs> and maybe at home you could uh, connect it to a large screen TV. <laughs> but praise the Lord. Anyhow, we welcome you to church. Thank you to the team and the crew for helping us make this occasion happen. For communion... I would like to read for us the first letter of John chapter 4, verses 17 to 19. I'll make a short commentary, then we'll partake of the elements. Verse 17 goes like this. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because... As he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us a couple of things here for love to be perfected in us we have a confidence, a boldness a certainty a guarantee and absolutely sure nothing is going to change absolutely, absolutely boldness in the day of judgment when Jesus comes again because as he is, so are we. As he is righteous, so are we. As he is the Son of God, so are we. As he is holy, he has made us holy. As he has promised us eternal life, we have eternal life. As he has welcomed us into his house, in his Father's house with his many mansions, we are also welcome. Because there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves a torment, an uncertainty, and maybe this and maybe this, a restlessness. And the way that happens is because some wrong teaching, some wrong understanding has come in to cloud a clarity about salvation and faith in Jesus Christ on that day of judgment. And perhaps I want to add here also, since Pastor Ora has already uh, mentioned something about it concerning this vaccine in this pandemic, I want to encourage all of us, all of us to receive the vaccine. Unless, of course, you have some medical issues, uh, please consult your doctor. If you have some allergy or something that you're not sure of, please consult your doctor. Do not form your own opinion and do not take opinions from WhatsApp and other chat groups. Rely on medical sources, proven sources. That would be the way to go. It so happens that I have uh, received a video, an interview from a, um, a doctor friend of mine. He gave a, a, a summary of what's happening. So... Nobody's DNA is going to get changed. Right? Just put that one out of the way. And nobody 
is interested to put any chip in you. Put the one out of the way. Those, those are gossips. Those are uh, um, just stories people make up to, to, to pull something from, from, from the Bible and so on and so forth to promote their own agenda. Fear involves torment. Love clears everything. Amen. So I want to encourage you uh, uh, to, that, to do that. And because of all this, the certainty that we have in Jesus Christ about our salvation and our confidence and boldness on the day of judgment, as He is, so are we. We love Him. We respond to that love, that fellowship, because He first loved us. Hallelujah. If you have your elements with you, have your bread. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, he blessed it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body that is broken for you. Let us eat. In the same manner, he took the cup. He also gave thanks, gave the cup to his disciples saying, this is the cup of the new and everlasting covenant. In this covenant, your sins are remitted away. We drink this remembering him until he comes again. Let us drink. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done all your wonderful promises. Thank you, Jesus, that you cleared the way for us to go home. Go home to heaven. And in eternity, is a long distance for us. Those who rest first fall asleep in the Lord. And then when He comes again, the dead will arise. Those who believe will arise and be with Him. And we who are alive at that time, should it be, we will also be together with them and be with, be with Him in the clouds in the rapture of the church. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. For offer tree, I'd like to bring us to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she poor as she is, has given everything she has. Hallelujah. The principle here is this. If you've been in BM Grace long enough, uh, especially when we read from 2 Corinthians 8 and 2 Corinthians 9, the encouragement in our offering, in our giving, especially in our tithing also, we predetermine what we want to bring as our worship. And what Jesus was seeing was these rich people, they just drop and give out of their surplus into the offering, into the collection box, like charity. But the poor widow came in sincere worship and gave everything. And obviously she is trusting God for something. Amen. She's trusting God for something. Hallelujah. In our giving then, let it not be an afterthought. Let it not just be loose change. Let it be a predetermined worship. Hallelujah. From our heart to His heart, to His house. Father, we thank You for everything that You've given us. And out of that abundance, we give our portion to you.
receive it, bless it for the use in this church and beyond. And Father, by your Spirit, teach us also to be good stewards of what you have given us, that we honour you in our offering, in our tithing, that you be blessed and we be blessed and our community also be blessed and our family. We want to do things right, Lord. So grant us this request by your Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. To give uh, or tithe online, please use the information at the bottom of the screen. Thank you, Lord. For our message this week, I make it as the mind of Christ part three, <laughs> carrying on from last week. And um, the mind of Christ comes from 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. It starts with this argument that the Apostle Paul lays out. Who knows God except the Spirit of God? Who knows man but the Spirit of man? If we do not know God, then we do not know what good things He has for us. But because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, that has fulfilled the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 40. The Spirit of God has been given to us. And because we now have the Spirit of God, we now can know, we can hear and we can see the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. And the, the reason why His Spirit is given to us is, is because, like we read in the communion, we are responding to His love because He first loved us and gave us His Spirit. And the mind-boggling thing is this, if you have received the Spirit of God, you have received the mind of Christ, that we understand the good things that He has in store for us. We can understand God. That's the mystery that is no longer a mystery because of Jesus. And continuing on from there, last week I mentioned that repentance on its own is inadequate because if you just think it's a change of mind, that in itself is inadequate. For, for the biblical context, it has to be repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ. That will complete the repentance cycle, and then you benefit and develop the fruits of repentance from there. Continuing from that thought, in coming to 1 John, or the first letter of John, I want to spend a bit of time, after all these uh, clarifications and filling in gaps and so on, I want to spend a little bit of time on the person of the Apostle John himself. All right? Now, so I concluded last week that repentance and faith are both sides, are of both sides of the same coin. I also implied that a Christian can still sin, but with a renewing of mind and living towards Jesus Christ and allowing His Spirit to lead us, we sin less. I want to develop this more maybe next week. Towards the end of last Sunday, spontaneously I was led to recite the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer. I realized that as I was saying it, I don't know if you noticed, I paused and I missed out a couple of lines. After the Sunday service, I asked the Lord, Lord, this is not very good. <laughs> I'm the elder of the church here, and uh, spontaneously I, I read or I, I, I pray the Lord's Prayer, and, and there's a pause, and a line is taken out. So I must go and, and, and fill it up. Otherwise, uh, people will say that, you know, <laughs> we have botched the Lord's Prayer. And so he ministered to me like this. The part that I miss is lead us not into temptation. And had I said it, because I was also explaining 
I would not have explained it as well last week, but I think I can do a little bit better this week. So our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. A couple of comments. There are some people who say that this prayer is Old Testament because it was taught before Jesus went to the cross and therefore is no longer relevant. I strongly oppose that. <laughs> I strongly oppose that. Jesus taught the disciples this prayer because they asked him to teach. All of them, all of them witnessed his death, his burial, and his, his resurrection. So all of them move from Old Testament to New Testament. And there's no new prayer that he taught them in the New Testament. This prayer that he taught them to train them to, uh, to uh, address God as Father is relevant, totally relevant for the New Testament. Forgive us our sins because we know that he has already forgiven us. It is a New Testament prayer. And so we are then, having received forgiveness from Father, to forgive those who have offended us or trespassed against us. And concerning the kingdom of God coming, it is His will. It's not us wishing like to strike a lottery. It is His will. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And Jesus says in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. So he has then brought the kingdom with him. His death, his burial, resurrection was his victory over the rule and the kingdoms of this world, that the kingdom of God comes according to the will of Father. And we then continue in that prayer working with the Lord, working with the Holy Spirit, that the kingdom of heaven continues to come and manifest in our midst. Lead us not into temptation. Is that puzzling for us? Since when is a good God leading us into temptation? A good explanation is this. Lead us not into temptation is... Protect us from situation that exposes our weaknesses. <laughs> Mercy, Lord. Protect us. A good example here is Exodus 13, verses 17 to 18. Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines although that way was near. For God said, lest the, perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. Can you see that? <clears throat> Lead us not to temptation, there are shortcuts, but I'm not ready for it. This is as, as the crow flies, but I'm not ready for it, Lord. So in your mercy, lead me another way. Because if we go this way, um, I might fail. I, I will struggle. So lead me by another way. Because the next line says this, but deliver us from evil. This way that is too tough for me, give me an option. But in all of this, deliver me from evil. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I hope that helped to fill <laughs> gaps <laughs> uh, from, from last week. Praise you, Jesus. Now, for this week, I wanted to 
I was led to this verse and uh, it took me quite a while to try and consolidate. I know this verse, but what is it about this verse and the surrounding context, Lord, that you want me to bring to your people today? And um, I had to read the first letter of John <laughs> this week many times, plus the second and third letters as well. I had to read it many times. And finally, I think what the Lord has impressed upon me is give the gist of what the Apostle John is trying to tell us and use his life as an example of what changes that we can see. And then, if we don't have enough time, we will continue next week. So it looks like God wants us to pause here, consider details, and don't uh, leave this passage of Scripture too, too early. 1 John 4, verses 7 to 11, reads like this. It's about knowing God through love. 1 John 4, verses 7 to 4. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested to us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The title I want to bring to us is from verse 9, that we might live through Him. The love of God has been manifested to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And we know the story very well. He became sin, died on our behalf. He is the propitiation for our sins. The propitiation means um, like paying a debt. And you pay and you pay and you pay and you pay and you pay. And then you keep paying until the person to whom you are paying is satisfied. There's, there's no end. But in the paying, he is the propitiation. He paid until it was satisfied and then he overpaid. So that there's absolutely nothing left to be paid. He overpaid. And that is his love for us. So this is then an invitation for us to not only receive his love, but to live our lives through the love that he has given us. You following me? Because the person who wrote this is the Apostle John. John is brother to James. Peter, James, and John are business partners in the fishing industry in the shores of Galilee. So when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee and called them to follow him to be his disciples, they dropped everything and followed. James and John left their father, Zebedee. So James and John were the sons of Zebedee. So in responding to that call, they became his disciples. And much later in life, by the time John was writing this, he was probably 90 years old. He was a young man when Jesus called him, probably let's say 30. By the time he wrote this thing, it was about 80, 90 something, so he's about 60 years uh, uh, time gap in between. 
we who have come to faith in Jesus Christ also have received an invitation, a call. Receiving His love, and now what we are realizing is it's not static, it's an invitation for us to then live the life that He has given us through Jesus Christ. Let me explain. Because in this love that God has given us and the life of the Spirit that He has given us, He transforms us, provided we allow Him to do that and cooperate with Him. Because then the process we've heard many times from Romans chapter 12 is that we allow our minds to be renewed, which is your minimal duty. And through this renewal of the mind with the Word of God, you come to know His will. And His will is for the kingdom of heaven to come. That's the Lord's prayer, right? And when the kingdom of heaven comes, it doesn't come apart from you. It comes including you in that dynamics of that kingdom where God reigns. And where He reigns and you are co heirs with Him, you reign with Him. And when His kingdom comes, it will be an expanding kingdom. Amen. So coming back to John, I just want to mention, remind us a little bit that we know about him from the gospel writings. And we see the transformation and I hope that in that process we'll be encouraged uh, by the words that he has for us. In a closing prayer last week, I mentioned the word fruit of repentance. I did not explain much of it in the message itself, but I mentioned it in the prayer. And by continuing today or this week and bringing John's uh, per person, the person of John, into our discussion, I pray that we can see the fruit of repentance, the transformation that happened to this man. So John is the brother of James, sons of Zebedee, in fishing business uh, and partners with Simon. He is among the inner circle of Jesus with Peter and James, right? Because the three of them were chosen and witnessed the transfiguration. So the three of them belong to an inner circle. Within this inner circle context, John seems to have a privileged position like a confidant. And he happily identifies himself as the apostle or the disciple that Jesus loves. Not that the disciples, the other disciples are not loved, but he personally got a revelation that Jesus loves him and allowed that love to transform him. Therefore, the encouragement to us, and as he, we read his, his writing just now, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. This exercise of love is not hard labor. It is the nature of God in us and overflowing through us. He has experienced that. And in us reading it, I pray the Spirit also will help us not just have word knowledge, but have understanding. And then from there, flow through us. There is not a legal requirement. There is the Spirit of God, and we have His Spirit, that we are then an extension of the love of God. He's a close confidant of Jesus in John 13, because he leaned on Jesus' breast, and Peter then motioned to him, by the way, who is he talking about? Because Jesus was revealing that someone will betray him. And the way they ate their supper or their meals is they're on a reclined position. They're not like us that normally sit on a chair. They are on a reclined position. That's why John could put his head on Jesus' chest. And Jesus told him who it would be, the person who dips the bread in the wine, and that was Judas. John was also the one when it was made known by the women that Jesus had risen from the dead, that he ran 
with Peter to the tomb. Being younger, he outran Peter. Although he didn't go in first, Peter went in. But John says when he saw the linen folded up with the towel just laid there without the body, he believed. So he would be first among the men who believed. Because until that time, even though the women had declared there was still unbelief among the disciples. In John 21, they had gone back fishing following Peter's not so good example. <laughs> they witnessed the, revel the resurrection and they were aimless, so they went back fishing. Jesus turns up at the shore and John recognized him from a distance. It is the Lord. At the foot of the cross, before Jesus died, John was there. The others have fled. John was there. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. And Jesus, hanging on the cross, says to his mother, Behold your son. And to John, Behold your mother. Why are these little details important? Now we try and understand the personality and the character of this man. John and James, Jesus nicknamed them sons of thunder, Boanerges. I hope I pronounced that correct. It was a nickname given by Jesus, sons of thunder. When I say sons of thunder, what, what do you get? What image do you get? Kind of loud, I guess. <laughs> uh, loud, boisterous. Maybe in the fishing, you know, the way they gave instructions was not like talking face to face. They would shout from bow to stern. <laughs> Whatever it was, loud is the idea that we get, right? And I think besides loudness in speech, we can also include in it a sense of understanding their temperament, they're probably short-tempered, didn't care much about other people, they just want to get their message across, and that's it. And they are also kind of ambitious people as I read to understand them, him a little bit better. In Mark chapter 10, and by the way, Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Uh, this is SOP uh, for leaders serving in the kingdom of God, since SOP is kind of popular these days, all right? Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Does it sound like ambitious and demanding, the boisterous, <laughs> whatever we ask? And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus was even prepared to entertain this question, right? <laughs> he said, then they said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left hand when you come in glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. And so Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink and with the baptism that I am baptized with you. With you, for you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand or my left is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself, and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. 
For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. That is a sermon on its own, right? <laughs> so you can imagine these two fellows, brothers, they have an ambitious heart. They're quite confident. They know that they, can have, they have a, a soft spot in Jesus, so to speak. We want you to give us whatever we ask. And Jesus then brought them to the Lord's thinking, to channel their ambition, to channel their earthly appreciation and comprehension of things, to channel it through the person of Jesus Christ to how the Lord thinks. Remember the mind of Christ part? We now have the mind of Christ, and so now Jesus is revealing how it should be rather than the way James and John were thinking that it should be. What you ask, I can't give to you. But if you want to seriously follow me, this is what I, I can tell you. I did not come to, to be served, but rather I've come to serve and give my life a ransom for many. You see those leaders over Gentile nations? What do they do? They lord it over them. And those who are leaders, they rule over them. Exercise authority. In other words, you are thinking of carnal, earthly type of rulership and you want self-gain, you want position. The SOP is that you serve others first. You want to be great, first thing is you be a servant. So can you see how John's thinking, together with his brother James, the two of them, was turned upside down by the Lord. And if it was just turned upside down and left as is, then they would have had a conversation and we wouldn't see any fruit. But we know for a fact that John's life towards the end was significantly changed. So here is this, this encounter. Here is this example of an invitation to be a disciple following Jesus. And along the way, you are free to express the desires of heart or the way you see things. And if usually then because it's not been renewed, and you are a disciple, you are still learning, you may say things that are contrary or doesn't quite line up with the SOP of Jesus Christ. But if we are willing to follow Him, then we get a renewal of mind, and our personality is not changed drastically, but our objectives, our sense of value, that gets altered. So we are reshaped like Him. It's just like, Jesus is the perfect glove and we are invited to fill that glove and get ourselves remolded to fit in perfectly. Then when he moves his hand, it is us in his glove. That's why John invites us that we might live our lives through him, responding to the love of God. In John chapter 13, verses 12 to 17, we have a similar uh, um, encounter. Starting from verse 12, John 13. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do so as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So again, this loud, impatient type person, ambitious, gets molded by the words of Jesus Christ and by the example that Jesus had said. Can we have any application of that for us now? As disciples of the Lord, it's not about our agenda. It's not about us ruling over other people. 
is about us serving the Master, inviting Him to reveal more and more of Himself to us, that we follow Him and are moulded by Him. And John invites us, now that we know the love of God, He is love and He has manifested that love by giving us Jesus Christ as a payment for our sins. And it was an overpayment. He has rescued us. And therefore, let us now live our lives through Him. That His objective, His purposes become ours. Because there was, imagine John speaking, because there was an earlier part in my life 60 years ago, I thought it was all about me. But I've learned that's not the way to go. He has much, much more uh, for us. In Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 56, we'll make it shorter, <laughs> 54 and 55, or 54 onwards. Uh, basically, he wanted to call he fire from heaven uh, to burn up a Samaritan village. <laughs> Because they would not welcome Jesus. This is John. Lord, they did not welcome you. They showed you disrespect. How dare they? We now know who you are. And all these Samaritans, them and their, they think they have a religion. They don't even know what they're talking about. We know what you have taught us when you talk to that Samaritan woman, right? And now look at the way they treat you. Would you like me to call fire from heaven and burn them all up, just like Elijah did? This is John. Can you imagine that kind of personality? <laughs> and, and Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And so they went on to another village. John is a kind of person, impetuous, loud, ambitious, absolutes, con contrasts. But God or Jesus saw in him the man had great potential to love and be compassionate. He entrusted his natural mother to his care. And when there was persecution broke out in Jerusalem, it was no longer safe to dwell there. So Mary, John took Mary with him and migrated to Ephesus. And it is in Ephesus that he wrote the first letter of John. I think I'll include this part. The background to the first letter of John was that there was some trouble brewing. Certain people had left the fellowship, left the church, and gone on to propagate their doctrine. And they had denied Jesus coming in the flesh. They had denied his lordship. They say he's no longer the Messiah. They don't agree. And a lot of them is, uh, that is from Greek thinking, separating matter or the material from the spiritual. Whatever it was, the sum total of that is that it is contradictory to the gospel. And here is this person, the same person of John. It is said that the Roman emperor tried to kill him and tried to cook him in boiling oil. And the story goes, John survived that and the whole stadium was converted. He was banished to Patmos by a Roman emperor and later on he was released by a different emperor so he survived emperors, put it that way. 
against this backdrop of wrong doctrine, he is very clear cut. He talks about us, you, and me fellowshipping with God. This is us. God is light. Jesus is the light of the world. The world is full of darkness. It does not know God because it does not have the Spirit of God. We who are believers, we have the Spirit of God, and so we know God. By knowing God then, you and I, with God, we have fellowship with one another. This fellowship excludes the world that is in darkness. This is a privileged, exclusive fellowship in the Spirit. In this fellowship, if you say you have no sin, you are a liar. Because while we are yet sinners, Christ died. And He came and became a propitiation for our sins. But if you have sinned, and you walk in the light, understanding who He is and what He has done, you confess your sins, and He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness so that your righteousness that He gave you remains. He further writes and says, well, I write to you in chapter 2 that you may not sin, which can be a little bit confusing here you are sinning, and why he's writing that you may not sin. It's like this. When you have the Spirit of God in you, your your new creation nature does not like to sin. Brothers and sisters in Christ, would you think about this? Do you still habitually sin? (laughs) And if you do sin, do you really enjoy it? Being honest about it? Because if you do, then you do not know God. You are not walking in the light of His redemption for you. You are still wallowing in the darkness. And so then, this letter should then appeal to you. This letter may even challenge you and say, are you really a believer or not? Because if you have the Spirit of God, that's not your default mode. With the Spirit of God, you are not inclined to sin. Because sin shall not have dominion over you. You are no longer under the law of Moses, you are under the grace of God. And he continues to develop because the themes that he has developed in 1 John... Sounds complicated because he, see, he goes in what we call an amplifying type language. He goes from light to love to fellowship and then he comes back again. And it seems to go over and over. That's just Hebrew thinking, but it helps us with the reiteration. He is light on this part. Here, he is love. God is love. The God who created, the God who existed before everything is love. We all know that you cannot be one and love because then you'll be loving yourself. So if God is love, it automatically introduces that there is a plurality in God. That there is one God, but there are three persons in God. Nowhere else Is it made as clear as this than in the letter of John? Other religions either have many gods or some are so firm and stern that there's only one God and nothing else, but then they cannot explain love. Because if God is love, how are we to explain love? We do not know that love because we are not God. But God revealed that love through Jesus Christ. And so if the teaching or the wrong teaching emphasizes that Jesus is not God in the flesh, then it cuts against this doctrine. Are you you following me? 
Anyone that says that Jesus is not, has not come in the flesh has the spirit of Antichrist. That's strong. Only the Apostle John uses language like that. And we know in our lifetime, in our lifetime, there are people who go about promoting their religion and so on. So they also want to have to spread their influence, right? And I really want every believer to listen very, very carefully because as a church leader from time to time, I come across people who in some time in the past, they had converted into another faith, uh, usually because of marriage and so on and so forth, and then things didn't go as well or um, a death has occurred, so now the person is either a widow or a widower, or in the case of divorce, a divorcee, and they find that that religion that they converted into or converted to uh, no, no longer has the appeal because the reason for it is no more. The marriage is broken down, there's a divorce, or the spouse has died, so that is now no more. But they don't have the liberty, the laws of the land are such, they don't have the liberty to, to convert to another faith of their choice. And the sad thing is I'm told that a lot of our young people who don't have an understanding of their salvation are easily persuaded that other religions are more attractive. Then the first letter of John chapter 4 says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Test the spirits, whether they're of God. And many false prophets have gone out in the world. He says, by this you know that the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So we can teach this to our Sunday school and teach this to our teens and our young people. How do you test if people are persuading you, you know, this way or that way, what is it to you? What is Jesus to you? Is he God become man? If they say, oh, no, no, God cannot have become man. God cannot have a son. A God has no wife. That is human thinking trying to understand God. Before God created, God is or God was. And in the God that is or was, because He is there in the beginning and He's there in the end, before we became men or created by Him, there was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father God doesn't need a wife, a human wife, to produce a son. That sounds like the thinking of Genesis chapter 6 that the fallen angels came and had a relationship with men and created hybrids and offsprings and they were all wicked and evil and so God sent in the flood. So if there's any religion that tells us that, oh, God cannot have a son because he is no wife, that is not of the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. Which you have heard was coming is now already in the world. So imagine 2,000 years ago there is already. In other words, the spirit in the world that does not know God carries with it a philosophical thinking that is by default Antichrist. You, you're with me? We don't have to create this label to just stick it with some people. It is by default. That, that is the world because the world interprets God through its own wisdom and so will shape God to fit what the world wants to see God as is. So whether they view it as distant or many or spirit only, nothing to do with flesh, Whichever combination, all of, the, of which will be contradictory to what our Bible has.
And John, in his old age, he says this. Those who have gone out from us, in particular, uh, in the second letter, he addresses it to a, a woman who is a leader of a, um, a house group, shall we say, a leader of a house church. And uh, she's very lovey-dovey, very kind-hearted, and so on and so forth, you know. And so she welcomes anybody and everybody into fellowship in her house. And John advises her in this fashion. Let me get to the page. In second letter of John, John advises this woman. He says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Maybe I should have said this earlier. The personality of John is such that he is quite comfortable to use strong language. <laughs> He doesn't mean his words, in other words. He is a changed man because of the love of God. He, his character has been reformed. But his personality has not been taken out of him. He's still John. And he uses very strong language. He says, these people who have left, they are deceivers. Strong language. And I hope that, again, that all, all, all our people will not get conned into giving up their faith in Jesus Christ uh, and converting into another faith uh, absent-mindedly or foolishly. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. Is that strong? Do not receive him into your house. Do not greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. <laughs> there, are, there are groups that go around, uh, they carry black umbrellas and black bags sometimes, and, and they always try and knock at your door. Uh, don't entertain them. There are others who use bicycles and wear ties and things like that. They have their own Bibles. They don't fully agree. Do not let them in. Right? And likewise, I know we are multicultural, multiracial, and so on and so forth, and it is inevitable that when we are in school, we rub shoulders with people of other faith and other religions, and there is an institution and so on and so forth. Therefore, church leaders, we must equip our people thoroughly and equip our people strongly uh, um, and, and properly. That we be confident, be bold when that day comes. For as He is, so are we in this world. That we don't have to look for something better and surrender this Especially if it's, oh, it's, it's a romance. Sorry, I, I was hoping that this may be next week, but anyhow. The last word that John left in the first letter of John was this. My children, keep yourself from idols. Little children, keep yourself from idols. There's no man and wo or woman in a romance that can be bigger than Jesus Christ. If you surrender your faith in Jesus Christ because of romance of a man and woman, that man or woman has just become an idol. Because that person has replaced your faith and your security and your everything. If you say you are a believer. Unless you're kind of confused, you, you, you're drifting around. Well, then in that case, you're not anchored and you are making a decisions made without biblical support. Well, that, I suppose, is you did not know. But if you do know and you still make that choice, then it's not excusable. Little children, keep yourself from idols. 
I'll conclude this, this way. In the third letter of John, he writes to a friend called Gaius. Little is known about Gaius other than he belongs to a home fellowship, a house church, that was led by another person called Diotrephes. And this is what is happening. Diotrephes has sided with those guys going around with wrong doctrine. He wants to have the preeminence with them. He wants to have, he wants to enjoy a certain popularity among them. And so that person has shut out anybody associated with the Apostle John. In that, situ in that town, in that district, there are some missionaries coming through whom John is aware of and may have been responsible to send them. So he writes to Gaius, may you prosper and be in health just as your, your soul prosper. Right? We know that part very, very well. He's writing Gaius with this exceptionally warm greeting. He says, by the way, Gaius, there are some genuine missionaries coming your way. Please receive them and bless them, supply them with whatever they, are, they need, and then send them on their, on their way. But keep them away from this guy called Diotrephes. Because he has done nobody any favors. He has sided with those who oppose us. And he has stopped everyone from fellowship. And John says, when I come, I will deal with him. Basically, John is replacing leadership there. This is, this is the old man. And uh, I'll close with this. <laughs> In his old age, they used to carry him. This is, this is uh, from Polycarp, one of his trainees, one of his disciples. They used to carry him to church because he was old. He couldn't quite walk. And they would ask him, Master, do you have a word for us today? And he would say, yes. And so in his fr frailty, he would muscle whatever strength he had, and he would say, little children, love one another. And he would sit down. And then they'll take him away. And next week, it will be the same thing. Master, do you have a word from the Lord for us? Yes, yes, I have. In great enthusiasm, he will muscle his strength just enough. Little children, love one another. I don't know why I feel emotional saying that. Maybe because in this week, I've had to read it many times. And maybe I got a certain deposit of it. If we don't know, cannot, would not resist to love one another, then <laughs> we have failed. We have failed. John, for his bombastic fashion, his loudness, and his, uh, you know... <laughs> Everything about him and his agenda, he is now completely, he's not mellowed in the sense that, oh, he's now a better man. Yes, he's a better man, but his personality has been altered, but altered for the good. His message to his people, love one another as God has loved us. And yet, this is what is said about him by his, his disciple called Polycarp, who later became the bishop of Smyrna. He says, there was one time John was brought to the bath. You know, this Roman bath, like an open bath. So he was brought to the bath. And uh, he noticed this guy called Serentus there. Serentus is the head, the leader of those guys who are going around with wrong doctrine. He immediately tells He's the people who brought him there. Let us fly, lest even the bathhouse fall down, because Serentus, the enemy of truth, is within. 
In other words, he will not share the same bath with Sorrentos. <laughs> This, this is John. What I'm trying to say is, he, there, is this, there are these extremes in him, but he sees things in, in very clear black and white contrast. He's not a man of compromise. And yet, he would say this, little children love one another. And so I want to invite everybody watching in This is love that God has manifested uh, His love to us through His Son, Jesus Christ, who became the propitiation for our sins, who became the payment, the complete, satisfactory, and more than enough payment. If you want to experience a new life, especially the life of love and hope and a confidence of our salvation when Jesus comes again. Then follow me in this simple prayer. Jesus, I want to come into your love. I want your love for me to just help me, free me, strengthen me, and I want to live a life through you. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. And for the rest of us, I pray that uh, even though this Sunday's message is a little bit different, I pray that uh, you will get a revelation of the love of God. Pray for me also that as I continue for next week, that this love continues to manifest in our presence, reveal and flow that we experience the love of God. Not just head knowledge, but we will experience it deeply. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Elder Thomas. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, Lord. And then we want to worship you wholeheartedly from our heart to your heart, Lord. Hallelujah. Our fight is with weapons unseen Your enemies crash to their knees As we rise up in worship When trials unleash like a flood The battle belongs to us as we cry out in worship The victory is yours You're riding on the storm Your name is unfailing No kingdoms rise and fall Your throne withstands it all your name is on
no one has seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. And His love would have been made perfect in us. Father in heaven, thank you. We ask for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. For today, we ask specifically of your love, ask of you and your love, that is your kingdom and your will to, to come. It came with your son. We have received your son. We have received your spirit. Continue to, to overflow and bless us so that as we love one another, you can be seen by others. You abiding in us and in doing so, your love made perfect in us. We ask this in Jesus' name. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you and will remain with you forever. He loves you. Go love one another. Amen. Yeah.